So uh, they asked me to talk about my career today, and uh, I'm going to start all the way from the beginning uh, and, and let you guys know how we did it, right? So first, let me give you a little bit of context. So far, um, the Young Turks and the TYT network have over 3 billion lifetime views, and uh, Variety said that uh, we're number one in the news talk category, Vice is number two, ABC is number three, and CNN is number four. Now, uh, I'm going to now go back to the beginning and tell you how that happened, okay? And it started out in my living room, and when we were doing that, I'm pretty sure no one would have believed that we would get to this point. Uh, and uh, that trailer you just saw from Mattis Hell, the documentary, tells this story as well, but I'm actually going to fill in the details a little bit. And so, uh, you know, this story starts with me saying a couple of things that are hokey, corny, right? Uh, I, I'm the guy who gives a speech about believe in your dreams and follow your passion. Uh, but you got to fill in the blanks there, and not a lot of people fill in the blanks. Okay, yeah, it's easy to say, oh, yeah, man, I'm dreaming, it's awesome, I'm follow my passion. Uh, but uh, I'm also going to tell you about what that entails and how we got to where we are today. So they asked me to go uh, all the way back to college, and so uh, I'm from an immigrant background, and so my parents insisted that I go to business school and law school, um, and so uh, my dad won. I, I wound up going to Wharton undergrad and then Columbia Law School, and he's like, yes, <laughs> right? Uh, then I said, okay, dad, this is great. Uh, now I'm gonna drop all that and be a radio talk show host. He's like, no! <laughs> um, and the reason I did that is because uh, a friend of mine, who I don't know if, to, if I should thank her, or I know my dad would, uh, in the beginning at least, cursed her, uh, said, hey, Cenk, you know, you should take this learning annex course right here in New York on how to start your own TV show. And I thought that was the most absurd thing I'd ever heard. Uh, but I was like, okay, I mean, that sounds fun. I'm open to new ideas. I'll, I'll go try that. And she basically said, go uh, to your local public access uh, station by law, they have to give you a TV show. And then she wrapped it up and we all went home. Um, and I thought, that's crazy, that can't be true. There's no way that's true. And I, I mean, I'm already so patriotic, I'm nearly jingoistic. Uh, and I thought, what an unbelievable country. They just hand out TV shows, <laughs> right? And so, uh, my first day at the law firm, and at that point I was in Washington, D.C., I left early to go uh, to my local public access station for orientation. And I came in and I said, all right, look, I left work early on my first day to try this nonsense. Okay, now you're going to tell me it's, I can't actually have one, right? And they're like, no, no, of course you can. You just go through this and boom, boom, boom. So October 30th, so almost exactly 20 years ago today, in 1995, I got on air and I did my first cable access show. And it was an hour long, it was about politics and philosophy. And I had gotten a couple of my friends together and we discussed it. And by all accounts, it was horrible. Uh, except for me. I walked off that stage <laughs> thinking two things. One, nailed it. <laughs> and two, oh, I'm gonna do this the rest of my life. Oh, I love this. And so, I'm a lawyer at that point, uh, but I didn't want to be, and what I wanted to do was get out of law as quickly as possible. Not just because I hated it and I loved uh, doing media and doing these shows, but because I, I wanted to make sure I didn't get used to the money. Uh, because if you get used to the money, uh, then you're stuck and it's hard to get out. And so, I remember this is back in 95, I was making $70,000 a year, which was a lot of money, right? But not, I guess, for lawyers, but for me. Uh, and I didn't make that amount until I got into TV in 2010. So for 15 years, I never got back to that salary, right? So the reason I tell people to fo follow their passion is because if you don't, you'll never be able to work 15 hours a day to make sure that your dream comes true. So I wouldn't have been able to put in 12 to 15 hours every single day in law. There's no way I could have done it. I couldn't have done it in finance. I couldn't have done it in any other field other than the one I loved. If you don't love it, you can't put in the hard work necessary to do it. So what does that hard work entail? 
Well, when I first got started, I sent out, I did the cable access show, I turned them into audio tapes, because the only place you can get a job back then as a talk show host was radio. So I sent them into 400 radio stations, 400 tapes, wrote an individual letter to each single one of them. Oh, you know, I would be perfect for Minneapolis because, right? Uh, and out of those 400 tapes, I got basically two and a half part-time jobs. A fill-in job in Boston, a fill-in and a weekend show in Washington, and then a, a, a very quick one I'll tell you about in Florida. Uh, and it would have been so easy to stop at tape 178 or tape 398. Uh, and believe me, there was a ton of pressure to do so. Because on the one hand, your parents, they say, oh, you got this law career, you were making good money, what have you done, what have you done? And they don't say that out of malice, they say it because they love you and they want what's right for you. And from their perspective, they don't want you to take risk because they don't want you to be in jeopardy, right? So it, what is incredibly hard to get past is loving advice that is not right for you, but is meant well, right? So that happened all the time from family and friends. Hey, Jenk, are you sure? Are you sure? Are you sure? Especially on tape 278 in year seven. Uh, I remember one day I'm in a store. I've got no money. And there's a Snapple staring at me, but it's 99 cents. And I'm like, man, that is, I can just have water. That's free. And I, I looked at that Snapple for a solid at least five minutes, no exaggeration. Like, <laughs> and, uh, and I think I decided not to get it. But <laughs> uh, so a lot of lean years, uh, I remember going on dates. And a lot of uh, girls asking me, you sure you're not going to go back into law? <laughs> um, so there was not a lot of breaks, uh, but I, I tried to make the most of it. Uh, and then uh, I, I wound up just going from radio to a TV writing and producing job down in Miami. And at that point, I tried out again for, to do my own show uh, on the radio, and in Florida, uh, they gave me a show for basically two weekends to try me out. Program director sits me down and says, okay, um, here's what you do, kid. Uh, you take calls all day long. You keep them to 30 to 45 seconds. Don't talk about yourself. Nobody cares about you. Uh, you just keep on going, and the callers, 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 that's what people care about. And I knew that that was nonsense. Now, here's a person in authority who's ready to give me a job. Uh, all I got to do is listen to him, uh, but I can't do it. So first of all, don't talk about yourself. The number one radio talk show host at the time was Howard Stern, who all he does is talk about himself. <laughs> so these gatekeepers, whether they were in TV or in radio, 98 out of 100 times had no earthly idea what they were saying, right? And people don't tune in to hear Bob from Hialeah they tune in to hear the host that they want to hear, right? So the guy was 100% wrong. So I was faced with a decision, what am I going to do? And I decided, of course, as usual, as became a pattern, was to do it my way. Uh, so instead, I took no callers uh, for <laughs> an hour and 45 minutes, told maybe the longest story of my life. And it was a very personal story about a heart-wrenching moment of failure, where I didn't make it, OK? And uh, at the end, I took a couple of callers, and they stayed on for at least two, three minutes. So I violated every rule there was. Uh, the guy calls me in the next day and says, uh, kid, you don't get it. <laughs> like, uh, I gave you a shot, but uh, it looks like you're stupid. <laughs> like, I gave you clear directions. You didn't follow them. You're gone, OK? So that might look like it didn't work out. Uh, but I'll tell you two things about it. First, um, there was a guy who's a, kind of a beefy frat boy kind of guy in sales. I was working in sales in Miami first before uh, the writing job. And I did not expect it. He came in and he said, dude, uh, I, I heard your show the other day. It made me cry. <laughs> and I was like, you know what? That's worth everything. That's, that's so much more important than that knucklehead program director's idea of, powering through calls, right? If I can make a frat boy cry, <laughs> and not in the usual ways they do, <laughs> uh, then maybe I did something right. And then, and the reason I had made that decision, and one that affected uh, a lot of my career is, I can live 
uh, with failing or not getting the job or getting something that I want if I did it my way. I can't live with it if I did it their way and it didn't work out anyway, right? And likely it's not going to work out if you're forcing it and you're trying to do what they want you to do. And then at the end of the day when it doesn't work out, what do you have left? You, d you didn't even give it a shot, right? So, uh, and that informed a lot of my decision making uh, from there on. So uh, in 1998, I write an email to my friends and I say, hey, I got it, man, uh, online video. Uh, it's going to be the next TV. It's going to take over TV, and, uh, and you've got to get into online video. As usual, my friends write in, you're an idiot. It'll never work. Uh, you don't know what you're talking about. Don't do that. Go back to law. <laughs> now, my friends are great. They, they never said go back to law, but they were very skeptical about online video. Rightfully so, a lot of people were skeptical back then. So um, I, I wound up continuing as a TV writer for quite some time, and then I'm in LA in 2000. I haven't been able to do the online video yet. At this point, I'm getting paid as a writer. It's not bad. I get to be on air from time to time. I was also a commentator. It's so halfway towards my goal. Uh, but I'm on my fourth writing job in LA, and I'm on a pilot where they want me to write for Daisy Fuentes. I don't know if you guys remember her, but she was like the original J-Lo, kind of. And, uh, and the producer comes up to me and says, we need you to write this more in Daisy's voice. <laughs> I'm like, I have no idea what Daisy's voice is. I've never met her. <laughs> Do I look like Daisy Fuentes? Uh, trust me, if you saw her, I don't. So I thought, no, 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 what am I doing? I'm getting misdirected again, right? And by the way, the, uh, writing jobs pay great, right? Uh, not the one I had in Miami, but the pilots, and they were all, they weren't, you know, a full year job, but uh, when you're getting paid on that short term rate, it's a great rate, right? But I said, no, I, I can't do this. The whole point is to do my own show. So I called every contact that I had that I'd made up until then. And uh, when I did the Boston shows, I used to drive from Washington to Boston every weekend to do the show, right? So Again, in the graduation speeches, they tell you, you know, oh, live your dream. I said, they don't tell you you got to drive like nine hours every weekend to do that, right? Uh, but that is what you have to do. And it's a good thing I did it, not because I got a full-time job in Boston, but because that program director, many, many years after that, when I reached out to him, said, hey, Cenk, i got to contact the Sirius Satellite Radio, and that's where you should go, and I'll help you. And he did, and that was my first big national radio show. He helped me to get it. Uh, so that hard work pays off, uh, and now, uh, don't get too excited because Sirius didn't even really know that we were on the air. We kind of snuck in through a consultant who said, yeah, I guess I'll put you on a sh station called The Buzz. I was like, oh, that's perfect. We're totally buzzing. <laughs> <laughs> and then about, I don't remember, it was six months or nine months into it, they realized that we were on their air. <laughs> we were actually their first original talk show. And they called me into New York and they said, okay, we found out that uh, you're uh, working for us and we're trying to decide whether to pay you or not. <laughs> so uh, he listened to some tapes. He's a great program director there. There's only two great program directors in radio and he was one of them. The guy who recommended me is the other. Everyone else couldn't graduate from high school. Um, so I don't have a high opinion of radio, as you can tell. So. Uh, he said, okay, you guys are good, I listened, uh, all right, you win, we'll pay you. So that was great, that was our first gig, it was me and my co-host Ben Mankiewicz and then Jill Pike joined us, and we're, we're cobbling this thing together, it's 13 years uh, from today, right, so it was 13 years ago, uh, and how we're going to put it together, now comes the hardest thing I've ever done, which is to ask friends and family for money, because I needed to buy a mic, I needed to buy a a little uh, a piece of equipment, and it's called an ISDN, to take the show from LA and, and broadcast it to New York, right? So the whole thing costs about $25,000. I have no other money, so we gotta put it in my living room, and Ben and Jill have to come in. Right? We have to find producers for free, and these two kids, Jesus uh, Godoy and J.R. Jackson, they show up from, uh, from uh, college, and, and they start producing, and I remember Jesus told me, I walked into your living room, and I thought I was gonna die. He's like, I thought I was going to a real radio station. I walk into this dude's living room in, on Sunset Boulevard, and I think, oh, well, it was a nice life, right? <laughs> Obviously, this was a trick, and this guy's going to kidnap me, and it's all over. Uh, Jesus and JR, 13 years later, still work for us. Um, now they're finally getting paid. 
Um, <laughs> and so uh, that's, that's how we started it. And, and, um, and a friend of mine who lives here in New York stepped up, uh, for which I am eternally grateful, and gave me that money so we could buy the mics and that radio equipment so we can get started. And um, but look, not being able to drink the Snapple, not making any money for 15 years is not nearly as hard as going to someone you care about and putting yourself out on the line and say, hey, I need your help. And asking for money is so, so hard. At least it is for me because I feel guilty about it. You don't know. Does anybody know when 13 years ago in my living room that we were going to be at this point and 3 billion views? And No, I didn't know. He didn't know if you told me back then. I'd be like, get out of here. I mean, I'm an eternal optimist, but I don't think I would have even believed that. And so, uh, but he, he did. He helped us and we got going. So from then on, uh, there was a lot of crazy things that we did. So uh, we decided finally, uh, about ex almost exactly 10 years ago, uh, that we're going to do online video. That's what I'd always wanted to do. That's what I believed in. I'm at a diner with this guy who's brilliant from Brave New Films, Jim Gilliam, who's a genius, now the founder of Nation Builder. And I say, hey, Jim, I always had this dream of doing online video. He says, oh, great. I'll set it up for you tomorrow. I was like, oh, fantastic. So uh, we, we set it up, and we start going, and then Sirius says, oh, by the way, we've got this nice contract for you guys. It's $250,000. We're like, yes! Back then, that was an enormous amount of money. There's like five, six of us working on the show, but we think $250,000 split between six of us is awesome, right? Uh, and they go, one qu uh, little thing, though, you can't do online video because people pay for our subscription, and so we can't have it out there for free. I'm like, no, it's marketing. It's marketing. We're putting out little pieces on online video. Uh, I was right. That's what Howard Stern's doing now, even though he's on Sirius Satellite Radio. Mel Karmazin was wrong. I'm still waiting for his apology. Um, but they said, well, what are you going to do, kid? Right? Uh, and I turned it down. I turned down the money because uh, I really, really believed. I'm a true believer. And so once we're on online, yeah, we're scrapping along. We found ways to get money. We got an Air America show and got a little bit of money from that, went on XM, et cetera. But now we're in the wilderness and we're online, but we don't, there's no infrastructure. Nobody else is doing any shows. Uh, we now have, at this point, we have the longest running daily stream. The reason it's the longest running is because nobody else was doing it back then. And so there's no advertising, there's no infrastructure, there's no help. We have no money, so we can't do marketing, we can't buy any ads. Uh, you know, people apparently have these things called bots that, they, <laughs> that they're running out of India. I don't know what a bot is. I wouldn't know about it if it, you know, it, it, it came across and hit me in the face. <laughs> so um, at that point, uh, we start experimenting. Now uh, the cool kids call it A-B testing. Back then it was called trial and error, right? <laughs> and so uh, we would go on Yahoo Messenger and be like, oh my god, did you see that Young Turk show? And everybody would be like, no. <laughs> right? uh, we experimented so much, we even tried MySpace. So that's how old school we are. Um, and then we put it up on this thing called YouTube, which came about about the same time as we did. And all of a sudden, it starts to pop a little bit. We're like, ooh, that's 89 views. <laughs> OK, now we're getting somewhere. And then uh, we did that for a while. And I remember the first video that went over 100,000 views. It's the most random video. It's this baseball player named Jose Offerdahl. He threw his bat during spring chaining at a pitcher. And, and people were fascinated by that. They started watching it and watching it. And I, I'm calling everybody. I'm like, it's over 100,000 views. I can't believe it. <laughs> um, we're rich. We're above the law. <laughs> okay. So I didn't really think we were rich. Um, so what was fantastic about the online world in YouTube is we had found it. We had found how to get past the gatekeepers, how to get to people uh, without having to go through uh, the guys who are going to stop you, judge you, uh, misdirect you. And so it started working. And so people ask all the time, why? Why did it work? It's not because we're particularly great hosts. It was the idea behind it. And if anybody else had done it, it would have worked just as well, I think. And the idea was just, it wasn't that we came up with a business strategy. It was just that. Uh, that's what we wanted to do, and it turns out that's what the audience wanted to hear. So what was it? It was just simply us being, A, real, so we didn't have any teleprompters. 
in TV, they all have teleprompters. They look into the camera and they read. So now, a lot of people that watch TV, you don't know that they're reading, but you know it in your bones. You can tell because it feels fake. Because they go, oh, welcome today, blah, blah, blah. And you're like, wow, that, that's not how a human being talks, right? Local news is the worst. Earlier today, there was twice as many ambulances as normal. But that's also because there was twice as many accidents. <laughs> right? Which human being talks like that, right? So when we looked at the camera and we told a story without a script and we said, oh, you're not going to believe what happened today. Dick Cheney shot his friend in the face. What is this? You could tell that we actually cared about the news we, uh, and it was authentic and it was passionate. In news they, business, they tell you, don't be passionate, which is amazing, right? They say, be dispassionate. Do not care about the news. So I don't get it. Does Wolf Blitzer, it, this, has he done this job for 20, 30 years and he could have been an accountant, instead he turned out to be a newsreader, doesn't really give a damn. Like, oh, there's a tsunami, oh, a Republican one, a Democrat one, I don't know, I don't care, right? Or is he being implicitly dishonest? He does really care, he does have an opinion, but he's hiding it like crazy, right? So now, don't get me wrong, the right wing will say, oh, liberal media bias, blah, blah, blah. That's nonsense. Uh, the overwhelming majority of the mainstream press is conservative by nature, not by politics, right? Uh, they're owned by giant corporations, and so from top down, they're told, okay, this is what's acceptable and this is not what's acceptable, okay? If you go outside the bounds of what is acceptable, you're a goner. And then I came to live that, which I'll get to in a second. But Phil Donahue opposes the Iraq war, highest rated show on MSNBC, gone. Uh, Ashley Banfield uh, speaks out against the Iraq war in a speech in Kansas. Uh, she's their big rising star at the time on MSNBC as well, gone. Jesse Ventura gets a multi-million dollar contract to do a new show on MSNBC. They find out he's against the Iraq war, gone. Okay. Now, uh, so in reality, the media not because of the people working in it, not because of the journalists, but because of who owns it, is fundamentally conservative. So there's an internal memo leaked later from MSNBC that said, we couldn't be caught not waving the flag when other stations like Fox News and CNN were doing so during the war. So and now oh, at the time NBC was also owned by GE, which is one of the largest defense contractors. Uh, but I'm sure the billions that they made off the war probably didn't affect their decision making at all. <laughs> the funny thing is, as I say this in mainstream press, they get really angry and they say, how dare you to question our honor, right? That's an outrageous conspiracy theory. Wait, you're telling me billions of dollars don't matter to you? Like, I'm supposed, we're all supposed to believe that you are not influenced by billions of dollars in profits that you can make. And I'm the crazy one, right? So it's preposterous. So, but this isn't my opinion, well it is, but it turns out it was the opinion of a lot of people. So when we started seeing it, and back then, we were almost, uh, the Amy Goodman that does Democracy Now! was a national show that was against the Iraq War, and we were a national show against the Iraq War, and that was pretty much it. There was a couple of local shows across the country, but I mean, it was an unbelievable monopoly saying, yes, war rocks, this is a great idea. And and people started saying, oh, you're an oasis. Yeah, I, wait, I thought I was alone. I'm against the war too. I'm against the establishment. And what happened was we accumulate more and more audience. Uh, we, we, so we don't do the prompters. We're not fake. Uh, and we don't believe in the establishment. And that turned out to be a really revolutionary idea. Because here's what CNN misunderstands. When they hired Jay Carney, he was literally a government mouthpiece right before CNN hired him for many millions of dollars. That doesn't really appeal to anyone in the audience outside of Washington and New York. So their buddies in the cocktail circuit are like, oh, I do declare you got Jay Carney, a brilliant, brilliant move, right? I don't know why they're British, but. <laughs> <laughs> so they think that it's a big coup to get Jay Carney. But the guy sitting in Wichita watching, he's not an insider, he's an outsider. And he doesn't give a damn what Jay Carney thinks, or Dana Perino thinks, or David Axelrod thinks. He doesn't trust them. So when we started doing uh, the show from an outsider perspective, 
well, then the views started piling up. It just wasn't that complicated. And at what point we turned around and we said, oh my God, I think they accidentally handed us the entire audience. Because the insiders are at most 2% of the country, right? The other 98% are outsiders. You want to give me the whole audience, I'll take it. And so we weren't particularly smart. We just wound up doing something that other people couldn't do, not because they weren't brave enough or bold enough or they didn't uh, believe that. A lot of people believe what we believe. They couldn't do it because they couldn't get past the gatekeepers. The gatekeepers were the establishment. They weren't going to have anti-establishment talk on radio or TV. So that is why the digital revolution was enormously important. So I remember in 2009, President Obama was giving a speech in favor of the Affordable Care Act. He's on a campus in North Carolina. The audience is very favorable. They're all going crazy. Yeah, Obama, terrific. And then he says, this guy is in charge of our health care plan in the Senate. He's a great senator, Max Baucus. And everybody boos. Wait a minute. How do they know to boo? Now, back, they're right. Max Baucus is a Democrat, but he's a sellout. He uh, gets more money from the health care companies than any other senator. Uh, but TV never told him that. TV tells them Max Box is an honorable gentleman from Montana who has certain ideas and cares and is principled and all this stuff. Oh my God, the kids got their news from online. And online told him Max Baucus is the number one recipient of healthcare industry money. So if he's in charge, it's going to be lukewarm at best. That's why they booed. That's when I knew we were going to win. So, and ever since, it has been hopeless for TV. So now let me give you some numbers to back that up. In cable news, uh, CNN's, uh, their median age for their viewer is 64 years old. MSNBC, 64. Fox News, 68. Bill O'Reilly's average uh, age of his audience is 72. The guy is doing a show out of a senior citizen center and he doesn't know it. Okay. That's why there's all those Depends ads and, uh, in his, uh, I'm not even joking, in during his show. And, hey, are you having trouble with an erection? Of course you are, you're 72. <laughs> right? And so, no disrespect to 72-year-olds. but, um, And our audience now is 75% under the age of 35. Now, let me give you a sense of scale. You could be really young, but you could have a small audience. But... Right now, uh, we're sitting at 100 million views on YouTube, 50 million views on Facebook, uh, and so uh, it's 150 million, not even counting Hulu, Roku, our website, and all the other platforms that we're on. Uh, and 66.4 million in July were unique viewers, okay? So if you've got 66 million unique viewers and 75% of them are under the age of 35, and those guys on TV are 68 and 64, who do you think is going to win? Right? It's already over. They just don't know it. Right? So now, I've skipped to the, to the final numbers a little bit here, but let me back up and give you one more story because I promised it to you, and it was when I went on TV. So we go through all the different radio stations. We go, we're online. We're doing well. Uh, and MSNBC back in 2010 says, okay, we've got a 10 o'clock slot open, we are considering people for it. And I decide that I'm going to declare my candidacy for the 10 o'clock spot. Okay. <laughs> now, nobody's ever seen that before, and my agent and everybody else says, no, don't do it. What if you fail? It'll be embarrassing. So now, at that point, I relied on a piece of advice I got from an old uh, radio talk show host a long time ago at one of those conferences that I went to. It's a great guy, uh, and I went up and I said, hey, look, you know, I'm sending all these tapes to these program directors, but I'm afraid that I'm going to annoy them if I call them too much. How do I draw the line here? How do I balance it out? And, you know, I don't want to burn my bridges. And he said to me, and he said, really, like, not again, not politically, but by his nature, a conservative talk show host, a little older statesman. And he goes, he leans into me and goes, kid, what fucking bridges? <laughs> right? It's like, you don't have any bridges. Who cares? Yeah, annoy them until they put you on air. Right? So that's the same line I gave to my agent. I said, what 
fucking bridges do I have to burn? <laughs> I don't have any bridges. So yeah, let's do it. And then our audience responded and thousands of them sent pictures of them holding signs saying TYT on MSNBC until the MSNBC executives were like, okay, okay, I got it. This guy's popular, let's bring him in. And eventually they gave me a shot, we got on there. I hosted, I filled in for uh, Keith Oberman and Ed Schultz and uh, Dylan Radekin and all, all these guys. Then I uh, did three o'clock uh, for an hour, uh, for a month. And then uh, finally I got the six o'clock slot, right? So, because they moved uh, stuff around when Oberman left. And so they put me at six o'clock, great, we made it. So a couple of things happened then. Everybody goes, okay, good. Uh, shut down the Young Turks and all that online nonsense you were doing. You made it, you're on TV. And I was like, did you think I was kidding? No, I'm not shutting it down. No, I'm going to continue doing the online show while I do the TV show. They're like, why? You're getting paid 10 times as much on TV. I'm like, I know, but I, I wasn't joking about the whole thing. Yeah, no, digital's going to win. TV's going to lose. No, I'm doing this whole TV thing for marketing. <laughs> right? So you misunderstood the whole concept. And, and so now... Okay, but that's all good and fine, but I think there's some chance maybe we could influence uh, President Obama and, and the Democrats if we're on MSNBC, because they all get it, the congressmen, all the rest of the media, they all have in their offices four TV screens. I've seen it in every news station and every political office. It's got MSNBC, Fox News, CNN, and then they rotate between CNBC and others, right? I'm like, all right, we're in the box, good, we're ready to go. Uh, getting good ratings, and then one day I get called in uh, to the head of MSNBC's office, and he says, Jenk, you know, outsiders are really cool. They wear leather jackets and wear motor uh, and, and drive motorcycles. And I was like, what the hell's going on? <laughs> right? I'm like, what, what's this conversation about? And second of all, no, they don't. <laughs> outsiders are normal people. They s sit in their house in Topeka and eat subs. <laughs> like, they're not James Dean. But anyway, okay. And he said, now, I, outsiders are really cool, and it'd be cool to be an outsider, but we're insiders. We're NBC. I was like, damn, it's happening. This is the speech. I thought it was more subtle than this. I didn't realize he'd just flat out say it, right? He said, we are the establishment, and you got to start acting like it. I, I couldn't believe my eyes. It was like out of a movie, and it was happening to me. And... Um, and he said, look, I was just down in Washington, and he never clarified who he spoke to in Washington. So I, I really, I have no idea who he spoke to. And, uh, but he said, they're not happy with your tone, so you got to tone it down. Uh, so I was like, oh, okay, yeah, I hear you. And I left his office. I called uh, Steve, uh, who works with me, and then later next week when I went to L.A., I called in all the guys, and we went to a bar, and I told them, okay, it looks like we're done at MSNBC. They're like, why? Your ratings are great and stuff. And... Uh, I said, here's what I'm going to do. Uh, they told me, they gave me this speech, so instead of listening to them, I'm going to go in the opposite direction. Okay, so I'm going to go balls to the wall, I'm gonna, and, and I'm not going to criticize anybody who doesn't deserve criticism, that would be ridiculous. The whole point of doing the show is honesty, right? And give them, to the best of our ability, the truth as we know it, right? So I'm like, next day I go on air, I'm like, here's what's wrong with President Obama, right? <laughs> And, uh, and then one day, Obama's giving a speech on uh, the Egyptian revolution, and he comes out, and there's a classic Obama thing where he's like, uh, you know, uh, the protesters, we love them, they're in favor of democracy, we're in favor of democracy, Mubarak, what a great ally of ours, totally in favor of Mubarak. I'm like, what? You just said two totally contradictory things. The protesters are against Mubarak. You can't be on both their sides. So I it would come out of the speech, it happens to be live in my hour, in six o'clock hour, and I've got all these generals and experts that I'm supposed to go to who's going to tell us that we need to use Abrams tanks, who they happen to consult for. Uh, and, uh, and I go, okay, I'm, uh, I said to the audience, I looked in the camera and I said, I was President Obama delivering a speech about the Egyptian revolution, and I'm going to keep it real with you in a second on uh, what he actually said. But first, let's go to General XYZ. My producer screams in my ear, don't keep it real. <laughs> okay. Later, they made up, a, like they say to me, and they believe it, they do, they're good, they're good people, they're just in that system. And he said, no, you can't be disrespectful of the president on the first day. <laughs> I'm like, wait a minute, so I'm supposed to wait a day before I tell people the truth about what he said? They're like, yeah. I'm like, that, first of all, that's preposterous, right? 
Second of all, it matters less than, which is part of the point. And third of all, you're not going to have me go back and talk about his speech the next day. We're going to move on. The whole point is, shh, don't speak out against the establishment. That's the whole point. And so once I started doing it my, more my way, the ratings went up and up and up and up. Uh, and then in July, I'm sorry, in, in, in the last quarter, so that would be April, May, and June, the second quarter of 2011, uh, they got the highest ratings they've ever had at, at the 6 o'clock hour uh, on MSNBC. Okay? So, of course, uh, the head of MSNBC called me in and said, you're done. <laughs> okay, I said, okay, Phil, uh, did I get good ratings? He's like, well, of course, yeah, you did, you did. Uh, and did I offend anyone internally? Did I go spit in anybody's coffee? You know? <laughs> He's like, no, no, everybody really likes you in the building. That's yeah, not a problem. Uh, I said, so you're telling me you're going to move me to the weekends? Yes. So off of prime time, yes. And here's the other part that was very interesting. He was going to double my salary. Okay. Now I'm like, why would you double my salary to move me to a lower time slot? And I said, so if it's not the ratings and it's not I'm a jerk, then what is it? And he sat there for like 45 of the most uncomfortable, awkward seconds of silence you've ever seen. And so I was like, oh, of course, it was a speech. I didn't get it. Right? He told me, he flat out told me to, you know, to tone it down and I didn't. So they were going to move me down. And then I realized later, oh, they're doubling the salary because they want you to be quiet. So here's a guy who until 2010 has never made more than $50,000 a year. I'm on TV all of a sudden. I'm flying first class. I'm being put up in really nice hotels. And they give you a million dollar, well actually it was more than a million dollar offer. What are you going to do? Everybody's going to take it, right? And then you're not going to tell people about that speech. You're going to be a good guy. And, and MSNBC is going to say, hey, look, we're progressive. And everybody's going to get along. Um, of course, I said no, uh, which they were shocked by. Right? Like, I don't know why people continue to get shocked when I say no. <laughs> right? How many times do I have to say it before you get it? Um, but it, it's not because, again, not because I was particularly brave. I had an advantage that no one else had. If any of the other hosts had done that, their career probably would be over. They're not going to get hired by Fox News. They're probably not going to get hired by CNN because they were on MSNBC and had a progressive position, right? They're done. So when you look at the abyss and they offer you, you know, like I'm watching Narcos on Netflix now, silver or lead, right? Either your career is over or you get a million bucks. A lot of people take the million bucks. I was in a great position because I had the TYT army behind me, right? So I had this whole audience. We'd won the crowd. And so in a sense, and this is my, I know it's corny, but it's one of my favorite lines from Gladiator when uh, Proximo tells uh, Maximus, you win the crowd and you win your freedom, right? And we'd already won the crowd. So I said, no, I'm not interested in that. And I, and I kept doing the Young Turks. And the one person who should get credit, though, is my wife. Uh, who's, I said, honey, I'm. I got this offer, what do you think? But it comes with this enormous string. She said, Jenk, we didn't get in this for the money, right? If we had, you know, you're not the guy I would have married. <laughs> and she was a social worker and had carried us for years, right? She said, it's the easiest decision I've ever seen. No, the answer is no, right? So she had my back. Uh, we had millions of people online who had my back. So that's what made it easy. That's what made it doable. So then we went online, and I said, all right, well, uh, let's show you how it's done. So right now, today, uh, TYT Network is larger than uh, MSNBC's digital presence overall, period. Okay, so their one host at 6 o'clock beat their entire network online. So uh, that's because we, we're not particularly great, we're not particularly smart, we're just giving the audience what they want. So at this point, 17% uh, of all millennials watch us every month. So in conclusion, let me just say that uh, if you believe in your dream, you're not wrong. A lot of people are going to tell you you're wrong because when you have a, an outsider perspective or you have a dream that is not conventional, they're actually trying to look out for you. They're saying, hey, don't do that. Don't take that risk. It's unlikely to happen. you got to get beyond that. But the way you get beyond that is an enormous amount of work and being true to what you really believe. 
Don't try to live out somebody else's ideal and somebody else's dream. If you're going to do it, do it right. Believe in yourself. And in the end, uh, as we've seen through the Young Turks, anything is possible. Thank you. Broadway has the Tonys, Hollywood has the Oscars, and now social media has the Shorties. Welcome everyone to the seventh annual Shorty Awards. The Shorties are by far the most prestigious. We are so proud to be part of the Shorty Awards. Thank you, Shorty Awards. Thank you for doing that. That was uh, pretty cool. I get a call, I gotta be at the Shorty Awards. I'll speak from the heart. Wow, that was awesome. There is not a more passionate fan base out there. Hi friends, what's up? Thanks for the Best Singer Award, I really appreciate it.